I, there's no need for me to be in a band. I am the band. I'd got to that point with my name, you know, in terms of public recognition. I didn't feel like I needed to join a band. You know, unless maybe like the Stones had asked me to join, then I would have maybe thought about it or some something like that. But, you know, we were the number one band in the world for many years. And so it would have been, I don't know how you stepped down. Maybe I would have joined an all-girl band or something, or the Go-Go's, something like that might have been interesting. Hi, this is Andy Summers, and this is On the Record with Ultimate Guitar. All right, Andy, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Uh, we're here to chat about your new solo record, which I've had a chance to listen to. Some fantastic guitar work on there. Oh, thank uh, you. A lot to be proud of. Is there a song <laughs> or, a, or a riff that you're most proud of on this record? On the record? You know, um, I think you've got a better uh, memory of it than I do. <laughs> well, you know, I like like the overall thing. Because it's fairly intentional, but there's this kind of this was a strange situation. It's not a normal one because I made a beautiful photography book and that, that came out in May last year and it's made, published by Tenois in Germany. So it was a pretty big book. And towards the end of their you know production run, I suppose they said, "Would you like to put some music in the book?" I went, "Music in the book? How, what? You know what? How, what's that?" But, you know, they've got one of those things on, you put your iPhone over it, and up comes the stuff, just like a restaurant menu. So I said, oh, you know, well, that's sort of an intriguing idea. Yes, I could. So, I, you know, I'd never done that before, but I've scored films. So in a sense, it's like this still photographs, but music to visuals, music to visuals. That's what it boils down to. And so I literally made this recording in about three hours, I just got, kind of got into the mood and it's kind of ambient and I've got all my lovely guitar pedals and et cetera, like everybody else. So it's very sonic and ambient. And I thought that was the appropriate kind of start the style to, to go with, with looking at these photographs. So that was it really. This was not like something I'd labored over for years. I, I, I sort of did it really quite quickly, but of course I've been playing all my life and blah, blah, blah. And I can actually do those things pretty quickly yeah so but uh, it's had a very good reaction which surprised me you know I'm, I'm pleased with it yeah i i got the sense that there's a lot of emotion in there um a lot of sweeping uh like you said the ambient guitar work yeah. um which surprises me that it was written and recorded so quickly well i made so many records you know and, and also ambient records you know it doesn't take me long to to find something but you know there was some thought in it you know i'd switch out of one thing go okay what should we do next you know i had the guy behind the desk ready to go and i'd search around for sounds and it, eh, you know the, i mean the playing was really promoted by the sound that i would get through whichever combination of pedals uh you know it's very much electric guitar stuff but the music emanated from you know this the sonic quality of the pedals and it pushed me into playing these chords or that chord or a single line or something else and that's that's the way it was but i i'm sort of encouraged because i could probably do it even better if i put it a bit more thought. i could take two two days to do it you know <laughs> <laughs> And we're we're big time guitar nerds, of course. And there was some really in, interesting use of, of pedals and effects in there. Mm -hmm. Were there certain pedals that really inspired you? Yeah, I mean, I can't remember exactly the moment. I mean, you know, different situations call for different pedals, obviously. You know, I mean, we've got our basic stuff, which is whatever form of sustain or overdrive, which we used to call a fuzz box. Now it's gotten fancy. Um, Chorus, of course, you know, which you can over chorus things, uh, various reverbs, some repeat echoes. So I'd have things like that. Um, uh, but I had some other pedals that were pretty, would do weird things. I mean, my only interest in pedals now, because I've got 5,000 pedals, as you might imagine, most of them which I didn't even pay for. Uh, I'm mostly in a pedal. What I look for is something that is strange. It's not chorus reverb or, or uh, you know, fuzz box, you know, it's something else. And I've got two or three that are really pretty weird. There's one called, um, well, not particular, something like that, but it does, does stuff that no one, no other pedal does. And sometimes it's a, a question of 
you know, combine, well, this, I'm sure you know all this stuff, you do it yourself, like combining the pedals to, till you get, oh man, that's fresh. Uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, now what if I play this with it? So, you know, the basis has got to be music, but I, I you know, it's, it's very much like, let's just make an analogy, like a painter with colors, go, well, you know, I've got, uh, you know, blue, black, and gray, how am I going to kind of do a thing with this? So if you regard these colors that way, I think it gives you a, a shot at, you know, coming up with something kind of original sounding. I mean, that my, my thinking is definitely goes that way, you know. Um, anything that sounds like no one else, that's what I'm trying to do. A voice, you know, you're trying to find a voice. And I, I believe I heard that you switched over to fractals. Um, when did you make oh. that leap from from tube amps to modelers and, and what sparked that decision? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess a lot of us uh, guitar players think about this now, whether we're going to go with, with the modules or, you know, you want to go hardcore, it's got to be a twin reverb or a tweed, or, you know, mic it up and all that, Yeah, which is all completely uh, valid. I believe in that too. I think some of the little old tube amps from the late 50s are incredible. But, I mean... On, in the modern era, in the modeling side, they do seem to have pretty much got it. You know, and man, you were in the studio, so much you just go push it in the whole man, it sounds incredible. You know, it, it's a little kind of a guilt trip, I think, that you go, oh man, no, I should use the real, you know, 59 tweed or whatever, one of those little Gibsons or one of those little Fenders. They're very expensive now to. But the fractal is an incredible box. I use it on stage. Uh, so I, I have to say I'm more likely to use the fractal these days than than to get out of the amp and go for all that stuff. The times have changed, you know, and the technique has become so, the technology has become so brilliant with this stuff that, you know, you've got to give credit to those guys too. I give credit to the guy who made that little amp in 1958 or 59, that's where we were with the big old valves. But I've got to give credit to the modern guys who are so genius and have managed to um, do that with it, you know. I mean, that is the world we're living in. I mean, you'd be, well, everybody finds their own way with it, but I think you'd be sort of insane to turn your back on some of the modern stuff. You know, it's not just that it's convenient. It's actually very good. I see you got one train later up there. That's nice. I do, yeah. Wonderful book, by the way. We'll, Thank you. We'll pitch that. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> wow. It's the first yeah. time I've seen it. That's very encouraging. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. You're a, you're a fantastic writer, artist, um, all this stuff. Um, so sticking with the gear, would you? is it fair to call yourself a Fender guy? Are you a fan of Fender guitars more than other brands? I'm generally known for playing a Fender. And Fender are an incredible invention, an incredible product. Guitars are great, you know, and you, you find which ones you like. And you, I mean, there's still a lot of Fenders I would like to have that I don't have. So I've been very involved with Fender. Obviously, they reproduced my police Telecaster, which was a big seller. Then they made this beautiful guitar in, I think it was 2017 or 18, with the photographs on it. I don't know if you've seen that one. I'm not sure what's next with Fender, but here's the very latest uh, with me, with guitars. I've, I've got this guitar called a Masters Electric. Don't know if that's come your way yet. Yes, this wow. is made by Andy Masters. Yeah. And he is the guy who oversees... Uh, Taylor Guitars in San Diego. He, he is a guitar maker. He's also the boss of that, because you know, I think Bob Taylor's moved on or something, or he's retiring. And now Andy, Mas Andy Masters, yeah, that's his name, is uh, made these little guitars as a sort of offshoot of Taylor. Incredible guitars. I picked one up in the Guitar Emporium in that's somewhere near uh, in Massachusetts, just while I was on tour very recently. Walked into a guitar store. They all saw me, and I'm, you know, suddenly there's a buzz in the store. I'm kind of looking around, you know, like somebody took me there and he said, You might like this store. Because like, I don't go to a lot of guitar stores, but this one was very dedicated and very sincere. And they had great guitars, all the stuff you'd expect, the Martin to give us the Fenders. And then there was this little electric guitar on the 
there was a few of them. I went, wow, well, hang on, what's that? That's a really hip looking guitar. I picked this thing up, short scale neck. Oh my God, it plays so easy. And I plugged it in, I started playing it. You know, it's one of those moments it called to me. It's a fantastic guitar. Uh, it's called Masters Electric. And there may be like a, another number like JK170 or something. It's got some number on it. But um, I bought a yellow one and I went straight on stage with it. I didn't hesitate. You know, it's usually all neurotic. Oh, I don't know. I can play it or oh, I got to work with it for a bit. No, this thing, man, I was on the stage that night with it. It's bright yellow. And I was so taken with it, I went back next day and I bought another one. So, And then I bought another one on the internet. So I've got three of them. So I've got a yellow one, a green one, and a purple one. And I'm just about to go into five weeks in Brazil. I'm taking that guitar. That's the first time I will have not gone taking the normal Stratocar. I will have a Strat down there as well. Uh, but this is kind of, I think the guy has got a kind of a breakthrough guitar with this one. Yeah, it's amazing. And I've heard you say that you prefer Stratocasters to Telecasters. Are there certain specs with the Strat that you prefer to the Tele? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I actually like the Whammy Bar. You know, I think that I'm, I like the Whammy Bar and the three pickups. I, I mean, I always was with a Telecaster. And my first one was a white 58 Telecaster, which was a great guy. I don't, I don't even know where it went, but I, I've played Strats for years almost exclusively. Of course, I also have, you know, another favorite is I have a Gibson 336 which is, a, you know, semi-hollow, whatever you want to call it, you know, the sort of scaled-down version of a 335. And I was playing that on tour a lot. I play around midnight, and I would play, uh, play it on that because it's a bit more jazzy-sounding with the humbuckers. So that's a beautiful guitar. Uh, you know, I've got many other... I've got 200 guitars. I mean, that's... Name a guitar, I suppose. <laughs> but anyway, these masters are really something to watch out for. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Andy has been a fantastic guitar maker in the acoustic world, and I'm ex excited mm -hmm. as in the electric world. So that's cool. You got to check this out. Yeah, it's a breakthrough design. It's very rare. You know, we've all been around guitars all our lives. You know, even with me, it's not my, often you see something that you go, "Wow!" You know, did something really actually made something different? Because there's basically three designs that everybody makes. You know, I can look at those guitars on the wall behind you. You know, yep. we all know those. Yep. <laughs> and there's a reason for them because that's how they, they sit on the body. And this cat's done something. I haven't spoken to him, but I think he knows. It was an odd situation. I was in this guitar emporium place, and it just happened as I was there getting excited about this guitar that there were three well, guys who worked for Taylor, and they all turned up. And so they immediately called back as I was going, what is this? You know, it was... That's sort of a lucky moment. So I wanted to talk about the dawn of your solo career uh, when the police ended. That's 200 years ago. Yeah, it was a while ago. I think I was maybe born, just, just born, something like that. Uh, but you dove headlong into a solo career. Um, was there Were there offers on the table to join a band? Why did you ultimately choose to uh, do some solo stuff? What, you mean post-police? Yeah. Oh, no. That, I, there's no need for me to be in a band. I am the band. No, I, I'd got to that point with my name, you know, in terms of public recognition. I didn't feel like I needed to join a band, you know, unless maybe like the Stones had asked me to join, then I would have maybe thought about it or some something like that. But, you know, we were the number one band in the world for many years. And so it would have been, I don't know how you stepped down. Maybe I would have joined an all girl band or something or the Go Go's, something like that might have been interesting. No, I felt absolutely I was on my own from, from that point on. And, you know, I did do some guitar duos with a couple of people, which was a lot of fun. I have played with other people, of course. And, you know, when I, I go out, I've usually got a band, so I think about that. So I am playing with other musicians. In fact, what I'm just about to do in Brazil is my setup, which is called Call the Police. And we, this gradually sort of organically came together. It wasn't that at the beginning, but uh, the other two guys, the singer bass player Rodrigo Santos and the drummer Joao Baroni, they're from very famous bands. So it's a, like an all-star group. Everybody's famous. And the um, it's all hits the police. It sells out every night. It's all sold out already. Yeah. It's awesome. So it's a great fun. Yeah. I don't mind doing it.
And another thing I was curious about, um, shortly after the police disbanded the first time, uh, you guested on Sting's solo album. I'm wondering what it was like working with him outside the context of the police. Well, we hadn't been apart that long, so it actually felt reasonably normal. I mean, clearly he was going off on his own. We all know this has all been written about and it's historical. I mean, you know, it was not a big deal. It was a session where I went and played the way I play on whatever the track was. I can't remember which one it was. It was in New York. I mean, I literally turned up this place with a guitar, plugged in, did the part, and that, that was sort of it. Uh, you know, it was you know, sort of trailing on from where we'd been. You know, he was awfully breaking off into a solo career, but there's a little bit of me on there, and, you know, blah, 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 and so so uh, what were your thoughts on sort of the wave that that you guys inspired in some sort of a way or the wave that came after all that great music that you guys created back then um, yeah. you know, with the thrash and the shredding guitar players? Were you a were you a fan of the guys like Malmsteen and, and Eddie Van Halen when they came out? Well, not Malmsteen. No, Eddie was a genius. Eddie Van Halen, I thought, was very musical. See, all that stuff he could do and all the this, all the tapping stuff he worked out, you know, he was he was kind of a genius guitar player, you know, very touched by something. And I'm so sorry he's not around anymore because I think he's one of the really the all time greats. I'd put him in the top five, no question. Mom seen, I suppose it's small, but it's all but too shreddy for me. After a while, it, I, my ear tires of it. But I didn't grow up with that kind of music, and it's very clever, sort of guitar technical stuff if you want to take, devote the years it takes to really get this tapping going but um, I'm not sure what the music is what it really produces musically if it's something I like or not but I, I definitely got Eddie, Eddie, Eddie's stuff I thought it was an amazing wonderful player but very musical you know? so you know that's a whole other camp you know that I'm not really in my camp is the police and what I did there. And, my, you know, my real skills are as a jazz player. You know, that's where I came from. And there's some very difficult stuff to play uh, from your riffs in the police, I believe. Uh, you know, when I yeah. first heard it on the radio, I was like, yeah, I should be able to play this. And then I'd try. And it's very mm. difficult. Something like Message you know, was. Yeah, uh, I'm doing a TV show with a, a girl from England next week. And, uh, she wants to learn how to play stuff, but I'm wondering if she's going to have the chops to be able to do it. it seems doubtful. Yeah, because it's not easy. I mean, it's easy if you're a real player and you've been playing all your life, but for someone just to pick it up and try and play something, they, they, ooh, they can't get their hands around it. And then another riff that you came up with, uh, Every Breath You Take, I heard that song was almost scrapped. Is that true? What was yeah, it wasn't really. That? No, we didn't. None of us really liked the song. It, it wasn't like, oh, this is the greatest song. It, you know, it just wasn't working. You know, there was a lot of argument about where the kick drum would be and the bass would be and all that. Uh, it, it reached a point. You know, we were. It was a tense moment anyway because we felt like Sting was about to leave the band anyway. And but we were finishing up and um, couldn't sort this track out. And then you know we were in the control room. Sting says, "Well." Go on, go in there and make it your own, which is like, go on and be the other author, the writer of the song. I went in, I almost immediately played that uh, lick, you know, that riff that goes all the way through the song. And that immediately put the song right at the top. And everybody stood up and cheered and clapped. And the manager said, that is going to go to number one. And it was. It was our first number one in the US. It's now past two and a half billion on Spotify. So that makes me the most played guitar player of all time. Right? It, it does. Everybody yeah. else has got two and a half billion. <laughs> it's the most played song of all time. Yeah, and I'm I'm noticing something when we're talking about Malmsteen and the Shredders and, mm -hmm. and talking about your guitar work. In your mind, what constitutes a good guitar part? You know, something that that is hooky, that can catch, that people can uh, relate well, to? Well, yeah, I you know, it's a good question. You know, I mean... Uh, Depends who you're talking to, really, you know. I mean, obviously the idea of a hook, you know, something that's just kind of got like a really kinky little kind of melodic phrase that just really gets you and you just keep wanting to hear it. Maybe, I mean, there's several ways you could describe it. I think one would be that you could stand to hear that over and over again and there must be so many um, guitar riffs 
in you know the history of rock music you know i mean how about chuck berry with the introduction to uh what's it called what's this johnny uh, be good johnny be good yeah. yeah 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 i mean for instance all of chuck berry's stuff i mean he was the master of the guitar riff and he, he was great at it I feel you I mean, listen to johnny be good and the way what I notice when I listen to those now is how much he swings. It's not like a rock play. It's almost jazz. Da -da 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 -da. And, you know, it's got a great um, feel and it's almost jazzy, but it's because he swings. So that, that was, uh, you know, these are the sort of immortal guitar riffs. I mean, you start with someone like that. I was trying to learn that when I was about 15 years old, of course, like you have to learn it, you know, yeah. uh, so I think there are things that stay in your ear like that, that they have to have that appeal that should be musical, but simple. So I wanted to ask you also about uh, working with Robert Fripp in the early 80s. What uh, what did you take out of that experience? How was that experience for well, you? Well, Robert Fripp and I are an unusual, the situation was not, not normal. We both came from the same town in England and he was this other guy that I'd heard about, you know, but I'd never met him. I don't think I did. Maybe I met him once, you know. I mean, in the town I came from in England, there are a few, you know, bands, rockers, kids, kids with guitars more or less, you know, young kids with guitars who wanted to be guitar, you know, we're all obsessed with music and wanting to be guitarists. And Fripp was this sort of outlier because he wasn't in the main town, but he was another smaller English town that was close by. And... um the weird thing was I played in this hotel, you know, when I was 16, like 16 years old, and I got a gig and became a professional musician at 16. You know, I was in this hotel group until they threw me out for chasing the girls there. And um, Fripp was, took over from me. It's a weird kind of karma. Uh, he became the next guitar player and very different player. And I can't remember much else in between, except many years later, he helped me out. He got me a gig before I was in the police. And I was sort of, I lived in California. Then I came back to England and there was a whole scene in London. And I met Robert one night and I was trying to get started again into playing in England. And uh, he, he got me hooked up. And um, then the years passed. Now I'm in the biggest band in the world. And... I started to, you know, want to f had the feeling to want to do something else outside of the band, just to sort of prove that I could do it musically, because I was so used to playing the same police songs over and over and over again. But my interest in music obviously wanted me, was urging me to try other, other forms, other ways of playing. And then I had this idea of trying to do a guitar duet with Robert, particularly because we had this local tie-up in our lives from the same town. He was famous, I was famous. There'd probably be an interest in it. And so we got together. We got together in New York, actually. I remember we got together in someone's apartment in the village and we were jamming, trying to see what we could come up with, what would, what would the music be. Um, I could do what I could do, and Robert's got his particular style, so that sort of polyrhythmic way of playing the guitar. And then, you know, we, we went actually back to our hometown in England. There was a little recording studio also run by a guy that we grew up with, and it was called Arnie's Shack. It's a peculiar little recording studio, and he was a sort of eccentric. He smoked a pipe while he recorded. And uh, we got there, and then we, we just started working things out. And oddly that you ask this, because right now... Um, about let's see, about 18 months back, he's working with a guy who said, I know you've got all the tapes, you've got all those tapes, you know, that you and Robert did, and there must be more material. And he was very agitated about it. He works with Robert. I said, yeah, well, I've got them, but they're all in storage, you know, the, the two-inch tapes. We put them away. He said, I'd really like to listen to those, and can you get, you know, so it was a kind of a, <laughs> we had to go through the motions. Eventually, the tapes got out of storage. They got sent. He got them in England. He reduced them down to whatever. And there's about 12 other tracks. And so he obviously worked. I don't know if he mixed them, because most of it's done with two or three guitars. But um, I was quite, I don't know if shocked is too strong, but I, when we got them, I was kind of knocked out. The great track. My God, why didn't we put these on the album? We did two albums. So out of nowhere, there's a third album. 
And I think that's coming out in September in a package, you know, on Robert's own label, which I'm fine with. So that's the whole flip story. And of course, he's he's sort of resurfaced in recent years with his wife, Toya, <laughs> you know, because he's not in King Crimson anymore. Those were incredible albums, and I'm really excited to hear the uh, the third one, the third installment. Yeah, well, it's surprising. I went, God, why didn't we do this? You know, I, why was I throwing those out? Because I was essentially the producer. But I, they, you know, listening to someone all these years later, and then I'm like, oh my god! Well, I see why they were no good. They're terrible. That's why we didn't use them. They weren't. They're all really. They're like the other tracks that we actually put out. And my god, third album. So who knows where that's going? I've heard you quoted as saying that you like darker music rather than lighter music, or that uh, what was it? Darker music is better than lighter music. Well. What's the darkest? Okay, well, we can talk about that, but you, you can't quite put it like that. It's too black and white. You it is. Have yeah. some great, you know, lighter music is much harder to play, much more difficult to pull off compositionally so that it's not sappy. You can write a lot of corny music. So we're not talking, we're talking about, you know, music that could be, let's use a word like jubilant, you know, glorifying the Lord, high, you know, all kinds of music. You have to go more into classical music that would be, raise the spirits rather than lower them um it's a very hard thing to do uh you know you got to, musically you know it would be, come down to kind of harmonic sequences and stuff like that that you know this is like talking about real serious composition unless you want to talk about lightweight pop music in that case i like the darker most pop is sad like the blues are sad. It's more about, you know, the things that connect with people are usually the more tragic things in life, the more minor key. Um, it would be very hard for me to, like, hit an A major chord and start writing a song from it. And that actually, I'll add to that, it's one of the things about the police, of course, is I always avoided all those. Well, I sort of say that. I mean, but uh, something like Every Breath You Take, I'm hitting that, always playing that ninth, added ninth or the second, so that it, it makes the chords different. They don't sound like major and minor. So you get a sort of a neutral position that's supportive, but doesn't dictate with major or minor, dictate the mood. So I like minor key music more, but... Um, I've written some stuff that's kind of up in feeling on the guitar. I've, yeah, quite a few pieces like that. You know, music can have many moods, not just sad or happy, but all the shades in between, you know. It could be enigmatic. It could be, you know, think about someone like Thelonious Monk. A lot of his tunes are very cheerful. Dun, 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 Da, 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 ba, da, ba, ba, da, da. You know, that's kind of a happy tune, but it's very quirky. And what Monk manages to do is uh, provide with genius, you know, these quirky melodies that are also kind of happy. In fact, I think Monk's stuff is tends towards, you know, they're bright, you know, they're not uh, really dark. I mean, he did write dark ones, of course, like Round Midnight, but uh, well, such an interesting composer. What would you say is the darkest song that you've ever written musically? You know, aside from the lyrics that were in the song, if there were um, lyrics. I don't know. I made so many albums. As, well, you know, like for instance, one of my last records, I'd, you know, you know I, don't think it's, I don't have dark as the right word, but, you know, like sort of minor key. I did a piece called If Anything, which I thought came off really well on, I think it was Shepard one of those last three albums. So it's basically like a drone in C minor, and then I'm soloing across the top of it, but it's mostly minor key. But, you know, the solo is sort of reaching. It's like reaching for something. So maybe something like that. I mean, I'm sure I've got other turgid ones in there. Um, I mean, on the Golden Wire, I had a beautiful... I don't know what it's called now. Hmm. Yeah. You have to have a look at my stuff. There's, there's stuff in there for sure. So to that kid who's just picking up his first guitar or her first guitar and learning to play, uh, what advice would you have for that kid, either technique-wise or business uh, Put it down and get a proper job. <laughs> <laughs> you find your way into it. Learn the basics. See if you're interested in going beyond that, you know. I mean, because it's... 
you have to love music, you know. If your curiosity, your curiosity, if you have natural curiosity, it will take you in farther and deeper into the guitar. And then you may find that, you know, I mean, that you if just the simple open chords are enough the kind of music you want to do. But if you're a real musician, you're going to go beyond that and you're going to get intrigued by you know, how things really work harmonically and then that you can alter chords and you can do all kinds of stuff with it and then, you know, your curiosity about music wake, wakes up and then maybe come, you'll become a real musician. So the other side of the oh. music business would be the business side. Uh, what was the best business advice that you ever got regarding... I've never had any good business advice. Oof. I would imagine you had a lot of bad business advice yeah there's a lot of people who want to rip you off when you're successful that's no question about that the sharks are out <laughs> absolutely the best business advice i can give anyone is learn it to some extent and be on guard be smart don't just take any what anybody tells you get other opinions yeah um, so i always ask this from people um what was your first guitar and what were some of the first songs that uh, you tried to learn I had a little Spanish guitar with five strings and a, probably something like a folk song like Tom Dooley okay. or Worried Man Blues. Just very simple, basic chords. So that's all I started with. Yeah. Then I got a sixth string and the whole world opened up. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have anything else coming out in 2024 that you wanted to chat about? Obviously, we got the new solo record. We got some stuff with Robert yeah. Fripp from back then. Yeah. Well, there's two, yeah. Um, I... Don't know if I, I might, you know, we're in a different era now, as you know. Um, so making the LP with the 12 tracks or sequence is not necessarily what you have to do or need to do because my time is limited because of so much travel. Um, my next period, I don't think I'm going to get it done now, but um, in August, I, I might try and make a couple of tracks to put on Spotify or whatever. I, I almost feel a, a way you can go forward now is just keep putting out tracks and eventually pull them all together and put it as an album, you know. But meanwhile, you can keep people interested by doing, you know, one track at a time. This is what my manager's telling me anyway. So I don't know if that's good good boss. I'm so used to, you know, a lifetime of making records, sequencing, trying, you know, the sequencing of it all. But I, I sort of like the freshness of the idea of just doing one track and it goes out and, and it is whatever it is. So I'm going to look into that. Maybe I'll do one in later on in August if I've got any energy left after playing in nine countries in South America. <laughs> well, we really appreciate the time chatting today. Uh, we appreciate all the music you continue to put out into the world. Thank you Thank so you. much. All right, mate. Have all a right. good one.